Today is October the 22nd, 2013. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And today I'm in Moore, Oklahoma to speak with Galen Kitch, the Director of the Emergency Management, Management for the City of Moore. This is part of our Spotlight in Oklahoma series and the topic today is the Mazinette. So thank you for having me today. Thank you. Let's begin with learning a little bit about you, uh, starting with when and where you were born. I was born in Hutchinson, Kansas in March of 1958 and spent my youth there, went to school uh, in Bueller, Kansas, which is a, a community nearby Hutchinson, uh, and did two years at Hutchinson Community Junior College and came to Oklahoma my junior year of college. Okay. And what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my father sold trucks for a living, and my mother was a homemaker. And brothers and sisters? None. An only child. I am it. <laughs> well, did you have certain chores you had to do when you were a child? Oh, well, sure. We helped around the house, and, and uh, we had about a half acre of land, and my mother liked to garden, so I pulled my share of weeds and, and worked in the garden. So. And did you have a favorite subject in high school? Uh, I was um, thinking that I would become an architect, so I took, uh, or an engineer, so I took math, science, uh, manual drafting classes uh, back in those days, of course, before computers. Uh, so, so I learned how to, how to do technical drawing. Uh, but my sophomore year, I was unable to get into a class that I wanted, a fairly small high school, small community. I took an aeronautics class, loved it. So uh, the uh, the culmination of that class was that you could could take your written test for a pilot's license. So I did and passed. In high school. In high school, and uh, my part time job, I went to work for a gentleman who had an airplane and had a he was a, a one man repair shop, uh, older gentleman. I was kind of his helper, and so I traded my my time for flight time. So I uh, I ended up with my pilot's license when I was seventeen. Any interesting stories along with that? Oh, uh, none that I'm going to tell. <laughs> Brothers, distance you've flown then? Um, all throughout the Midwest. Uh, again, this was based out of Kansas, so they're a little bit farther north. But I've been to to uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Denver. Uh, flown uh, here to Oklahoma several times. Went to, uh, flew to Harlingen, Texas, which is about as far south as you can get uh, in Texas, and uh, went to an air show there, so. And do you still fly? I do not. Uh, once I once I became a college kid in Oklahoma, <laughs> you know, money, money went elsewhere, so. So what brought you to Oklahoma then? I actually came to Oklahoma to pursue a major in meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. And what year was that? Uh, that would have been 1978. So you're a master's then, or? Well, I didn't finish in meteorology. Okay, okay. I'll go back uh, up then. <laughs> I, uh, I went three years, and, and uh, while I was, about the time that I came to Oklahoma, or just a little before, I became interested in radios. I probably played with radios more than I studied, so uh, I didn't finish in meteorology. Uh, came to work for the Moore Police Department as a communications dispatcher, uh, and eventually went back and finished a degree in public administration. Okay. So uh, take us through your career path then. Uh, in 1980, May of 1984, I was hired uh, again as a dispatcher here at the at the Moore, uh, for the city of Moore, dispatching police and fire units. Uh, I also had a strong interest at that point. I still had the interest in meteorology. Uh, I had been a storm spotter for many years. And at some point, uh, became involved with, as a volunteer here, uh, although I was already a volunteer for the city of Norman, I, I began working up here with the civil defense folks. And in April of 1991 became the volunteer emergency management 
uh, or civil defense director, uh, while I was still a full-time dispatcher. Uh, did both for uh, quite a few years. Uh, in 1996, we, the city chose to make a full-time position of emergency manager, and I slid into that position. Uh, in 98, uh, they also had me supervising the 911 center, uh, which I did for 14 years, in addition to being the emergency manager. And in January of this year, they uh, they split the, the dispatch uh, operations off, and I'm back to being full-time emergency manager. Not much time for fun through there, huh? Well, it's all fun. <laughs> well, like off the job, I guess. But. So describe a typical day for you now. Typical day for me now uh, involves um, paying attention to the weather determining whether there's any threat, weather threats to our city uh, for any given day or, or for the upcoming set of days. Um, if not, I, I um, spend my day in planning and training and we exercise and we, uh, I manage our city's radio systems. Uh, so that's why all of the gear over here. Um, we're in the process of building a brand new facility that will house uh, our police department, our municipal court, uh, the 911 center, and we will have a full emergency operations center. So we're uh, we're looking forward to that. So on a, on a day that it's not as clear as today, and you're having to watch the weather, what what would be what would you be doing? Uh, on storm days. Um, of course, we, we generally know several days ahead of time, perhaps even a week ahead of time, that uh, the following Monday there may be severe thunderstorms. We never, of course, know that there are going to be severe thunderstorms here, but we know that in general uh, parts of Oklahoma will be, be subjected to thunderstorms, some, some of which may be severe. Uh, spend a lot of time making sure people are aware of that. I interface quite a bit with our uh, school district and, of course, with our city crews, our police crews, fire crews, uh, some with the uh, our businesses via the Chamber of Commerce, uh, because the, the, the real bottom line is that uh, I can be prepared, as prepared as I want to be, but that doesn't do somebody else any good if they aren't prepared. So we try and give them the opportunity to have the knowledge to make a decision of whether to take some action proactively to uh, th that might be some protection to them. On an actual storm day, uh, we're making, again, we're watching the weather, we're passing along the information that we get uh, from the Weather Service, from the Mesonet, from the Storm Prediction Center, from uh, you know, perhaps the television guys. Tailoring what they're saying to my 25 square miles. Okay. Um, we're making sure that our communication systems are uh, operational and, and working the way they should. We're making sure that our outdoor warning devices, our sirens are all functional. And if there's if there's something that we need to do to go fix one or double check on one, then, then we do that. When, if storms fire, uh, we're watching, as you can see, we have an array of technology in here. Uh, we're watching, always watching the radar, always watching the mesonet, um, watching the, the television stations. Uh, at, at the point that we, we observe that there are storms beginning to fire or the conditions are right uh, to where there may be a threat to our city, then we activate uh, our storm spotters. We have about two dozen and they deploy in various places to the west generally and southwest of our city and they they watch the weather and report to me what they see uh, which I in turn if, if it's something in significance I, I share with the weather service and of course the weather service is always sharing with us uh, what they're seeing on radar and, and their various sources. 
uh, if tornadic conditions are directly threatening our city, then we activate our warning systems. Uh, again, we have a uh, system 36 sirens through our city. Uh, we're activating those. Uh, we do have voice capability on about two thirds of them. So we can not only uh, alert people, but we can, can provide them with information as well. Um, we're sending out email and Twitter and Facebook and uh, keeping the police and fire advised via the radio systems. And uh, unfortunately, we've been hit several times. And at that point, we move into response and recovery. The one that's most in my memory was the 1999 one, and you were already here in place. Was it, and that means and it was already up mm -hmm. and running too. Did it come in handy? Uh, was it helpful to have it that day? Do you remember? The um, We actually had um, not only the Mesonet, but we also had the OK First uh, products, which at that time was radar. Uh, and back then, the radar wasn't nearly as accessible uh, to the public as it is today. Mm -hmm. In those days, uh, the radar information uh, was not available unless you paid for it, uh, and it was very expensive. And most uh, most people outside of, of commercial television did not have access to it because it was so expensive. Uh, the OK First and Mesonet people made that available to us uh, in public safety at no cost other than they required us to come to, to free training. Free, free training. Free training. And, you know, what a deal, you know, twist my arm some more. Um, and we did have radar uh, in here on uh, May 3rd, 1999. And it was, it was useful, but it was not, um, it wasn't the, the main source of information. Um, which sounds very surprising because normally it is. Uh, however, on that day uh, and some other subsequent large events, uh, we found that the television, you know, the, there's no beating the, the uh, having two or three helicopter shots all from different directions. Uh, you know, ground truth doesn't get too much better than that. So, uh, you know, the, the television people are telling us where the storms are at. The radar is telling us where the storms are at. So. Uh, not not too many people have spoke about OK First. Do you can you elaborate a little bit more or or not? OK, I was one of the original Mesonet participants, um, and that and in the early days, um, of course, the internet was just starting to come along. Uh, computers were just starting to come along. We didn't have. You know, I can assure you, I didn't have seven or eight flat screens in a corner and two more over here on my desk and another one over there uh, and a pair of laptop. You know, all of the all of the things you see here, you know, I had one laptop and that was it. And the the information that the Mesonet brought us was just invaluable. Um, we had never seen before really where lines were, were at. We knew those boundaries existed, but it was very difficult to, to accurately pinpoint where they were. Uh, you know, you might, you might know that there was a dry line boundary of some sort between Enid and Woodward. Well, when the Mesonet came along, we could pinpoint exactly where that was and made our, our uh, of course, made the, the weather service forecast far more accurate, uh, made our real-time uh, situational awareness far uh, more accurate, uh, allowed us to provide our responders uh, with more pinpoint timing of when you know a wind shift might happen uh, to the firemen out on a fire scene. So it was just, just a tremendous tool, just in the what the Mesonet brought us. Uh, as I said earlier, we did not have access to radar in those days. Um, and in fact, even before uh, OK First came along, when I was a, uh, a young volunteer uh, working with Norman Civil Defense, 
Uh, if I didn't get to go out storm spotting on a particular day, I might get assigned in their, their operations center. And one of the jobs that somebody had there was to take the one television we had and dial between channel four, channel five, channel nine, back to five, back to four, five, nine. And you just, you continued to dial back and forth between the three television stations, hoping that they would come on, break in and have a radar update. And if, if you saw that the radar, you know, some one of them had a radar up, you stopped and you'd yell, radar! And everybody would stop what they were doing and hope that we got to see 10 seconds worth of radar in our, our particular area. Because again, they're covering all of the state or the, or the western two-thirds of the state. So, uh, you know, they may be, may be focusing on a storm in Ardmore. And you're like, no, 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 show up, show up here. We want to see what's going on. We thought we were really, really hot stuff when uh, uh, they received a, a slow scan TV drop of the radar from Channel 4. And you get an update every minute or two minutes showing what, what the Channel 4 radar had. We used that for several years. Uh, and on the old teletype uh, weather system, once in a I, I don't remember how often now, but they would send radar information that was nothing more than a grid of information and, and it would it was made up of numbers that would show it, at that particular spot you know whether it was uh, an intensity of one two three four or five and so you'd, you'd get these and, and you'd, we'd have acetate overlays we'd put over them so that we would know where we were at and then you would look for, okay, there's, there's where something is. Uh, very primitive by, by what we have today. So we'd had Mesonet for several years, and we finally found out that they were going to... The, 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 the Mesonet folks, uh, Dr. Crawford, um, Dale Morris, Andrew Melvin, uh, saw very quickly that there was a... A tremendous need for radar information in our in our emergency management community, and the as I recall, and Dr. Crawford would have better information on this, but as I recall, the uh, commercial contracts between the four uh, vendors of the Weather Service radar information, uh, their contracts were coming up for renewal, and. Dr. Crawford was able to uh, negotiate a, a contract with one of those providers to receive radar data that he then was allowed to redistribute for free to the emergency managers in Oklahoma. And what a tremendous tool. You know, we went from, from having nothing to all of a sudden we had radar information. and, and there was such a uh, tremendous demand for it because the emergency managers also knew that that was, was a fabulous tool. Uh, but the weather service people were very uh, leery of, of allowing non-meteorologists to see that sort of data and, and all of the data that went behind it. And uh, it was a very, very tenuous relationship at the beginning. Uh, because of that, and uh, as I said earlier, the the okay first folks uh, would not allow us to access their system unless we went through their training, which was three or four days. And and I know the very first class, uh, the radar interpretation section was actually put on by the weather service uh, warning or the radar training people down in Norman. <laughs> it, it was interesting. They, uh, they learned something very quickly that uh, most emergency managers, particularly of that era, were either retired policemen, retired firemen, uh, a few that came out of communications or emergency medicine, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but mostly police and fire. And uh, most had been a long time since I'd been in college. Uh, if they had college at all at that point. 
very few had uh, degrees in either mathematics or uh, the sciences. So here are all these people very experienced in public safety and they're learning about DBZs and all sorts of, of really technical scientific stuff. And after the first day, now I had a background. I, I had been through meteorology school, so I knew some of it. Um, and I can tell you, even at the end of the day, I was going, oh my gosh. And I looked over at, at one of my mentors and his eyes were glazed. <laughs> he, 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 he had lost it about an hour earlier. He was like, I have no idea what they're saying. Fortunately, the uh, Dale Morris and the, the OK First trainers recognized that as well. The next day when we came in, they said, all right, we're going to stop, rewind, and redo, and we're going to try and make this in a format that you're going to understand. And they did, uh, did a fabulous job of that, and they require us to go back for refresher training. Still. Still. Yeah. And it's, it's a wonderful program. We learn about the meteorology. We learn about the the physical side of the radar a little bit. Uh, the the training, uh, our last set of training has uh, focused on the uh, dual polarization upgrades to the radar, and they told us up front this is going to be very very deep, and you know there's there's five five things that you're going to look at. Just use one of them get comfortable with it. And then when you get comfortable with it, try another one and see what you do. Um, and in fact, I have a, a uh, that's what that poster is uh, on the board there. You can see where they actually made sheets for us for each one of those five products that uh, explains what it is, how to use it, what you're looking for. It doesn't get into the science of it. Some, but not much. Uh, and I know that I've used it considerably, and, and I hear other people talking to them and, and go, well, did you, did you use any of the, the dual pole products? Yeah, I used this one. Man, it's great. So. Uh, have you used all five? I, ha I have. Yeah. But again, I, had, I have a background in science and technology, and uh, even though that's not what my degree is in, I, I have that background. So I... Mm -hmm. I get along with that side of it maybe a little better than some others. You get called to interpret? <laughs> Not so much. Not too much. Is it still free, the training? It is still free. It's still required. Um, I believe it's now every 18 months you have to, to go through a refresher. Uh, and that's when you receive your new password. And if, if you don't go to refresher train, they, uh, they take your access. How many is usually in the class? Well, there's generally always 15 to 20, uh, depending on the size of the, the uh, it's all hands-on, so you have to have it either bring your laptop or, or they have them in computer labs. And sometimes they're, the connectivity or the size of the lab dictates the size of the class. And has have you found other uses for the Mesonet besides helping you with fire Oh, absolutely. To you? Oh, absolutely. First of all, uh, the, the, city's, the city's break room is right next door to me. And the, the door to go outside for the smokers is right out here. And so it's very common uh, for people to be roaming up and down this hallway. And they all know that, that I always have radar up and know what temperature is, know what the forecast is. And they'll stop and they'll look and what's on the radar, Galen? <clears throat> or what's it going to be this weekend? I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm gardening or I'm going to a football game or I'm doing whatever. So uh, we've sort of turned this into Weather Central, uh, which of course has its benefits because on storm days, these same people know that they have a direct source of information that perhaps is not... got to search for the right word here. Uh, not concerned about ratings or, or selling ads. Uh,
that was a UPS that just fired, so. Okay. Everything's still up, so. Losing power in here is, is, is a big deal. And it's worse on the other side of the window. Um, but on storm days, uh, the same people that go by the office and look in, uh, they'll, they'll look in and they'll kind of look at the radar, but then they look in to see how nervous I look or how busy I look. And if I'm, if I'm sitting back and, and, you know, not doing much, okay, that storms aren't here. Or if, if I'm ramped up a little bit, particularly uh, on storm days, I'll move around to where you're sitting on the back side of the desk and, and turn things around so that I operate off, off this triangle instead of over here. If they see me on the back side of the desk, they're, you know, that's the sign, oh, something's going on, and, and which allows them to, to think about what actions they'll take. Um, we've also used the mesonet uh, extensively with our road crews in the winter. Uh, they know whether to uh, sand or not sand, and whether there's rain that goes with it, or whether, you know, is it going to actually freeze here? Is it going to be maybe, or is it going to stay warm? Uh, where is that line at? Where do we think it's moving? So uh, a lot of use for that. A lot of use uh, by the fire department. Uh, and our dispatchers when they have fires, uh, knowing what the wind's doing, is our wind shift coming, do we need to take, you know, if, if we're fighting this from the from the north side and the wind's going to turn around and then blow that in our face, you know, do we need to be prepared for that? So a lot of uses. Uh, the constant observation too, I guess you have to be alert at all times. The, uh, the one thing I'm going to miss moving into our new facility is that I won't have this big plate glass window behind me where I can take a look outside once in a while and see what it's really doing. I mean, I, yeah, I, I can see it on the on the mesonet, I can see it on the radar, and, and uh, you know, the TVs are there, but there's nothing like looking out the window. And no window at all in the new one? Uh, not where I'll be able to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, our new facility is being built uh, out of 10 inch thick concrete walls that um, when we have storms that we don't have to worry about our safety. That makes sense. If I had read that Moore's had, in the last 15 years, has had five major tornadoes. Six. Six. No. Well, let's see. You said 15 years. Yeah, it's five. Um, we, on November, I believe it was 19th of 1973, we had an F3 long before my time now. Uh, I was still a, in high school in Kansas at that point. Uh, but there was a tornado came up through from Blanchard, uh, came across uh, just west of us here. Um, we had a couple of fatalities in the trailer park with small children. Um, I believe there was a fatality or two in Blanchard and there was one up just north of us. Um, no tornadoes after that at all until uh, October 4th of 1998. Uh, that was, a, again, an out-of-season storm. It was after dark. 40-some uh, tornadoes in Oklahoma that night, uh, which was a, a uh, high number, or a record high number uh, for October. Uh, one of those formed uh, to the west of my city, uh, moved through uh, the north and west part of my town, uh, no one hurt, no uh, no fatalities. Uh, most of the damage with that was probably straight line winds from the uh, rear flank downdraft, uh, but we did have a little bit of tornado damage. Um, thought we were very fortunate. Uh, thought, wow, it's the first tornado we've had in 20 years. You know, I'm, I've had mine. You know, the, the next one will be the, the guy that follows me, maybe. Seven months later, on May 3rd of 1999, we had you know, five long track tornadoes started down in the Lawton area, uh, tracked right up I-44, continued to track right through my city, uh, destroyed 800 and some homes. Uh, we had five fatalities with that, um, probably a couple of hundred people injured. Uh, very significant storm. Uh, the 
truck mounted mobile radar uh, uh, intercepted that storm uh, west of us over in the Newcastle area measured uh, winds in excess of 300 miles an hour which I think today still stands as the the highest wind that's ever been recorded uh, in one terrible storm. Uh, we watched that storm out the window, by the way. That's my F5 window. Um, recovered from that. Uh, we, it took us about three months to clean it up, haul it off, building began again. Uh, within a year we had a lot of the homes rebuilt, moved on down the road. Which brings us to May 8th, 2003. And we had another one. This one was only an F4. Uh, again, about the same track. All of these were tracking through the northwest corner of our city. All offset just a little bit from each other. We didn't have a lot of repeat uh, damage locations. Uh, again, six, seven hundred homes destroyed. Uh, this time, instead of it just being rubble on the ground, uh, we saw, you know, a wall here, a wall there. Uh, there was more of the homes that were left, but they were still destroyed. Um, no, in, uh, no fatalities. About thirty injuries, uh, none serious. Picked up, cleaned off after that one. Uh, did pretty well until May tenth of twenty ten. We had a tornado form just to our southwest. Uh, one of our spotters actually it formed almost right on top of him. Uh, moved across the southern parts of our city. Uh, didn't do a lot of damage in our city. A lot of fences, trees, uh, roofs, uh, that sort of uh, damage. Uh, didn't really get organized good until it was just east of us. And then it went on and, and did some significant damage east of us. The, um, which brings us to this year, May 20th. Uh, knew it was going to be a storm day. Was hoping it. We knew that that there was the potential that it would form just to our west. We kept hoping it would hold off long enough to where to where it was east of us. Uh, it did not. It went from clear sky to towering severe thunderstorms within 30 minutes. Uh, went from thunderstorm to tornado on the ground within a, just a few minutes. Uh, we were a little concerned about the 20th because we knew that typically if we have significant tornadoes here they generally five, six, seven, eight o'clock at night the, the November storm on the 70, I don't know when the 73 storm, I believe it was an evening storm. Um, October 4th, 98 was, was 8, 9 o'clock at night. Uh, May 3rd was 7 o'clock at night. May 8th was about 5. Uh, May 10th seems like that was a 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock type storm. Um, but May 20th we were looking at the 1 p.m., 2 p.m. time frame, which sort of scared us because we knew that that would put it around school dismissal time, uh, the time that buses would be out on their routes. Um, you know, it's May, kids are out doing outside activities, whether it's baseball, uh, whatever they're doing. Uh, and we were a little concerned about that. In fact, we'd been concerned about it all day. Uh, we had told our uh, school folks bright and early that morning, today's a storm day, and it's a different storm day. It's, it's, a, it's going to be much earlier. May have considerations for the schools. Uh, and unfortunately, we were correct. Uh, the storms formed about 20 miles to our west. I uh, sat down uh, the first tornado around Newcastle, 2.42 in the afternoon. Of course, the television stations were on it. We had our spotters out. Uh, you know, we, we knew it was a high-risk day. Uh, in terms, not 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 referring to the 
the storm prediction center is high risk, moderate risk. It, we just knew that, that there was a pretty good chance of storms, and if we had storms, they were going to be pretty significant. Uh, the storm tracked right up uh, from Newcastle, uh, approached our city. It was a very slow mover. For as fast as it built, it moved extremely slow. Uh, we believe it entered our city somewhere around 3.15, 3.16 in the afternoon. Uh, my sirens on the west side of town lost commercial power at 3.17, so that's probably close. Um, tracked up through the, the uh, started in our city uh, in the addition to the west and south of 19th and Santa Fe. Uh, did some da uh, quite a bit of damage there. Uh, and then the Oklahoma City section that's just north of that and west of Santa Fe. Uh, some very significant damage, F5 damage there. Uh, destroyed Briarwood Elementary School, which is on the Oklahoma City side of the line. Uh, even though it's a more school. Um, moved through the Plaza Towers edition in my city, including a direct hit on Plaza Towers Elementary School. Uh, we had seven fatalities there, school-aged children. Uh, we also had several other fatalities in some homes right around that school. Uh, continue to track uh, through the uh, south end of our cemetery, uh, across Little River Park, beautiful, what had been a beautiful park, uh, decimated, trees are just decimated. Uh, started a, a left-hand turn, which is, is common among larger storms as they start to, to uh, perhaps die out a little bit. Um, there's some school of thought that uh, instead of dying out, the storm actually made a loop and then tracked uh, due east or even south of due east, uh, which is very rare, very odd, very odd for us. Uh, the path width at that point narrowed down considerably, but the storm was still very violent, very strong. Uh, it destroyed our hospital. Uh, across the street from the hospital uh, is a convenience store, was a convenience store, had three fatalities there. Again, moved across the hospital, destroyed it, uh, destroyed or significant damage to the post office, destroyed a credit union, a bowling alley, and some other businesses right there. Uh, moved across Interstate 35 uh, into an addition south of 4th Street. Uh, destroyed about two blocks worth of homes, uh, two blocks width worth of homes there. Uh, tracked across an empty field into a street that has several large metal industrial buildings. Uh, apparently there was a gentleman that lived inside of a trailer inside of one of those buildings. He was a, a fatality. Um, continued across uh, in the area of um, Southeast 8th and Eastern. Again here the storm is still narrowing down. It's maybe about a block wide at this point. Still very intense. Still, you know, whatever's in the path is being destroyed. It's just not quite as wide. <coughs> um, tracked along the, through the Silverleaf edition. Again, blocked two blocks wide at that point. Um, crossed the back side of Highland East Junior High School. Um, they had significant wind damage to the HVAC and their roof on the main building. Uh, destroyed their gymnasium building. Very fortunately, the center of that path went through their large, uh, vacant uh, football, uh, track, baseball, you know, just, just basically empty, empty lot. Um, tracked on east uh, through the J.D. Estates, uh, addition uh, through Veterans Memorial Park. Uh, again, a very, very new, very uh, highly used park. Destroyed a playground there. Uh, started making a little bit of a left-hand turn. Destroyed some very new homes uh, in the Heatherwood, uh, Windermere Lakes, and uh, Stone Old Stonebridge Editions. Uh, and finally, after destroying 
a business and a home right on Sunny Lane, moved east out of my city. Uh, 20 fatalities total in my city limits. Um, 1,000 to 1,200 homes destroyed. About 60 businesses. Again, we lost uh, a school. Uh, lost the gymnasium off our junior high, or one of our junior highs. Uh, it also, I don't know what they've decided, but the school's administration building uh, was very severely impacted. They're still not backing yet. Uh, I don't know whether they're going to end up uh, taking it all the way down or just part way down. Uh, took out the, uh, on the back side of that building, there was a newer uh, metal structure that housed the school's technology department. Completely wiped it out. So they lost all of their computer services, uh, servers, all of their telephone system, all of, you know. Mm -hmm. And again, they were, they had fatalities at one of their elementary schools. They had another elementary school on ground. Um, so, you know, they, they needed their technology, they needed their phones, and they didn't have it. Uh, very, very significant storm. Um, probably worse than May 3rd, which is kind of what we everybody's judged off of up until this point, but I think this will be the new the new standard for, for that. Um, thousands of volunteers, hundreds of responders. Um, Who has to manage all of that? Or you, it's you? very difficult. Um, the you, police and fire, of course, manage all the responders. They have a, an incident command system that they use. Um, the rest of it, for the volunteers, uh, we actually had some local, uh, a local pastor and some, some people that they said something needs to be done. They whipped up into an organization that's called, now called Serve More, and wow, <laughs> fabulous job of, of managing. Uh, I think they, at one time they said they had 35,000 people that had come through. And I think that included all states and I th either all continents or close to all continents. Uh, just, just an amazing. But we have that cleaned up. Um, but before we got it cleaned up, uh, that was on May 20th. On May 31st, we had another round. Uh, fortunately, the significant storm of that day did not come here. It was in the El Reno area. Uh, very odd set of storms. Uh, not the usual, you know, fire up in the heat of convection, move to the northeast. This one fired up along an east-west line. The storm moved straight east, and the whole line sagged south. So, very odd. Um, a number of um, smaller vortices in that. Uh, we ended up with an F-zero storm here. Uh, in fact, I watched it go across my parking lot, watched that siren right there uh, swaying back and forth in the wind. Um, we actually took cover a couple of times here. Uh, the um, uh, take cover for about a minute and then go right back at it. Uh, very, very difficult. And of course, everybody was still living in the memory of, of the big one that had come through 11 days earlier. So. So yes, we've had our share of tornadoes. We don't want any more. Any theories of why always more? <laughs> why it seems to be more? I mean, is there any theory? If you look at the history of tornadoes in the Oklahoma City area, uh, I don't know what the number's up to now, but I think it's over 100 storms in 100 years. Um, and there are lots and lots of lines all over the metro. Six of those, well, actually more than that since it goes back farther, but um, but six for sure through my city. But if you look at any other area on the map, there's there's storms that have hit Edmond, there's storms that have hit Bethany, there's storms that have hit eastern Oklahoma City, there's uh, some storms that have hit Norman. So um, we've had our share. We've had our share of big ones lately. Um, I don't think that we have enough historical data to to really say is it is that a a true phenomenon or we just you know happen to be 
Uh, I can tell you that uh, when I became the emergency manager, I visited uh, one afternoon with a lady who used to be an administrative assistant in the city manager's office. And at that time, she had probably worked for the city for 35 years. Uh, she ended up retiring with 41 in. Um, and I was asking her, you know, what, what events have we had? What have we had for tornadoes? What have we had for, for train accidents? What, you know, what, what big things have we had? And of course, we were talking mainly about tornadoes. Uh, and she had said that the, in her youth, that she had lived on a farm uh, in, you know, north, a couple of miles northwest of Moore. Well, that's up in one corner of my town now, you know, very developed area. But it, but at the in the time of her youth, you know, it was still farmland. And she said that the old timers of her day had talked about there being a tornado alley through Moore. And I asked her, you know, where where is that? And she, of course, couldn't remember. It'd been been many years, but but we we came to the conclusion that it would be. Uh, in the area along perhaps our Janeway Avenue uh, and somewhere between 12th and 27th Street. And, pardon me just a second. After the May 3rd, 1999 storm, I went back and asked her about that again. And she had said there, there had been a little rise there and there was a little airport and always, the, the storms had always come along and knocked the aircraft hangers over. Of course, I'm sure that, that of that era, those were, were just uh, wooden structures that didn't really amount to too much because, of course, airplanes didn't amount to too much back then. Uh, but we came to the conclusion uh, that that track was right along but it was basically the track of the May 3rd storm. And in fact, we believe perhaps that the little airport that she, or landing strip that she was talking about, was right where Kelly Elementary School stood. And of course it was destroyed on May 3rd. So, um, you know, is, is there really a track? I don't know. Um, you know, one would have thought prior to this year that we perhaps had a track and that it was on the northwest corner of our town. Well, then May 20th came, well, May 10th of 2010 came along. It was the far south end of town. And the storm this year tracked right across the center of town. Is there a track here? I don't know. It's all been covered no more, huh? <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that we, we have to deal with in looking at the historical records were that until, well, clear up through the 73 storm, as far as I can find, there was no damage assessment on the 73 storm. Uh, there weren't spotters. Oh, there may have been spotters, but there weren't the chasers like we have today that are recording you know, with great accuracy exactly where that storm is and what's damaged. Um, I have a map behind you there that, that has tracks of all the storms, and the 73 storm is simply a guess. The, do the storm chasers, are they trained or organized or by, by you or someone else? Or, or the storm what? spotters for the city are. Okay, there's a difference. Okay. There is an absolute difference between storm chasers and storm spotters. Well, explain that then. The spotters are, for the most part, residents or people who, who are from right around here that have an interest in protecting their community. They, uh, they activate only when I activate them. They... They, we send them to fixed locations, and, and they stay in those fixed locations, report the conditions, and when the storm blows over, they go home. Uh, chasers, on the other hand, uh, may travel hundreds of miles because they, they tr they're trying to forecast where a storm's going to be and, and try and intercept that storm. So they're, they're looking for to see whether the forecast is correct, whereas our spotters, we simply erect a fence along along the, the boundaries of the city. So the, 
the chasers um, have different motives for being there, uh, whether it's research, whether it is being in awe of nature, uh, whether it's the adrenaline junkies that, that go out and, and get a high from that. Um, there, there's lots of different reasons for being there. Well, after each storm, did things improve for the better prepare you for the next one? I'd like to think so. Um, you know, on the, the storms of 98, the fire chief uh, at the time then said that, that that helped him prepare for what happened on May 3rd. Now, obviously, they were very significantly different in magnitude, but um, prior to 98, we hadn't had a storm in 25 years, 22 years. So, you know, there was some old timers that remembered it and, you know, methods changed, uh, resources changed, uh, warning and forecasting abilities changed, the city changed. Um, and 73 would have been kind of toward the end of a, a huge growth spurt for the city of Warren. Um, in the 60s, we were a, a community of 4,000 and by Again, this is before me, so I, I probably have the dates wrong here. But by the 70s, that had grown to 40,000. Uh, at one time, we were the largest, fastest growing city in the... In the oh, spurred the growth. I'm just curious. The growth was spurred, I'm told, by a lot by um, busing, school busing. And uh, when Oklahoma City began busing, then more affluent, uh, typically Caucasian people uh, moved to Norman, Moore, and Edmond okay. and fled the city. Well, there's other people that, that, that are far, far more versed on that than I am. That was a little bit before my time. But, but, um, well, in your time period, though, you've seen changes too, if you came in the early 90s. I came in uh, 84. And at that time, we were probably 45,000 population. Today, we stand at 56,000. Um, resources have significantly changed in my time. Uh, when I started, we had maybe 45 police officers. Um, don't remember how many firemen, uh, but three stations worth of firemen. Today, we have four stations worth, um, and they're manned with four and five people on each station on each shift, whereas in the older days, uh, sometimes we were lucky to have two guys on a truck. Um, today we have uh, upwards of 85 police officers, so our police department's almost doubled. Um, but we have a lot more to protect. You know, 15,000 more people, uh, more business, uh, very vibrant, growth and, and uh, so, so yes a lot's changed so the day after a significant weather event what would you do in, in your particular position it's, it's fast how, so no, how do you define the day after because I can tell you that in the three big storms that we've had May 3rd May 8th May 20th that you work around the clock. My normal work day would normally end at five in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, that doesn't happen. Uh, on May 20th, uh, again, we were hit three in the afternoon, roughly. Um, worked all evening, overnight all the next morning, all the next afternoon. And finally by seven, eight, nine o'clock, um, and, and this wasn't just me, it was the fire chief, the police chief. And and we all had enough experience, we knew we'd be doing about a 24 hour. And then if we could get through to the, the next evenings, you know, early evening, that we would probably be able to spell long enough to go home and get some sleep. And I think we all did. But 
in the aftermath, of course, you are um, doing the immediate search and rescue, immediate uh, medical treatment, triage, uh, transport if necessary. Um, you're trying to dig through the rubble. You're trying to find people. You're trying to account for people. And here this year was very different um, in that I, I let's see. Uh, we had the city manager in here with me. Uh, command was not in here. Uh, command was at, at one of our fire stations uh, closer to the scene. And as it turned out, that was a perfect place for it. Uh, it was close. It, they had a very large, uh, brand new fire station. Had you know, They emptied all the truck bays out, put tables up, and they were able to accommodate the hundreds of people that it took to to manage such a large operation. Um, having the school hit really changed uh, some of the way they had to do things. Um, I think they were aware early on that they might have some fatalities. Uh, took them a while to, to get to them or to, to, to be able to verify it and then do all of the things necessary with that, but, but they knew they had a significant issue at Plaza Towers Elementary. Um, and that particular school is not an easy school physically to get to, uh, but uh, they had the, uh, our state has a task force uh, for urban search and rescue. It's made up of uh, personnel from Oklahoma City and Tulsa, uh, primarily the fire department, some of the police, uh, some other departments are around. We had Task Force One here. They were, were working at the school, uh, so you're you're trying to. What well, what I was trying to do was support anything they needed, um, plus hundreds of phone calls, uh, a lot of media calls uh, from all over the world. Um, I talked to BBC Australia. Uh, not very long. Fortunately, we got our our uh, media personnel in here and, and push those calls off on them. But we were still uh, receiving calls from people offering help, people saying, I'm on my way. Wait a minute. Did we ask for you? No, if not, stay home. Um, so it, it's, it, it, it's all about supporting what the police and fire need because they're, they're the boots on the ground. There's got to be some preparation planning ahead, too. To As all cities and counties, uh, we have a, an emergency operations plan. Um, in fact, we review it every year. I just finished this year's review. It's in this notebook right here. And it spells out, in general terms, how we, how we do business. Um, and probably the simplest concept there is that each of our city departments does business doing the same things that we would normally do. The firemen are still doing fire suppression, search and rescue, medical triage. Ambulance people are still doing triage, treatment, transport. Um, the police department is still doing scene security. They're doing investigations. They're doing, uh, in this case, missing persons investigations. Um, they are doing uh, traffic control. You know, public, public, work, public Works is still taking care of the streets. Uh, water Department is still taking care of the water system. Uh, it's just on a much larger scale. Lessons learned from this year that you carry forward? The This one was a little different, or these this year. I mean, again, we had two of them, but um, they were a little different uh, in that... The news is such more immediate. Um, you know, people watched the tornado live all over the country. And so therefore they were calling immediately. Uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget on the night of the 31st, uh, again, 11 days after the big one, um, that the wind hadn't even stopped blowing. And one of our local television stations called no, we, we need an update. Yeah, the wind's still blowing. 
don't have an update. And hung up with them. Uh, and I can understand that. They're, they're local. They're, you know, that, that's, that's what they do. Uh, the second call I got was from a television station, I believe, in Minneapolis. I didn't even know what was going on. First of all, I don't have time to talk to you. Second of all, go away. And third of all, you know, I, I was probably very rude with them. But uh, in thinking about that since then, I'm like, why in the world were they calling? Was it going to be breaking news in Minneapolis? And, you know, I thought that's what the national, you know, ABC and NBC and CBS and I thought that's what those people were for, were to report national events. But, but the world's changed. And every television station's trying to be the first one on the air. And you know, we told you first. And so uh, their, their drive to do that perhaps um, doesn't make a lot of sense to, to those of us in public safety, and particularly to those of us that have to answer the calls when we're busy doing other things. We had a huge presence this year uh, with our social media and, and public information and, and uh, the one or two people we have that do that here at the city on a normal basis recruited like two dozen people to help them. And you know, you'd, you'd walk upstairs where they're normally, you know, one of them has an office here and one of them has an office here. And there's there's all these desks in the, the area between and all these people, and you're like, who are you? And they were, they had been recruited to help. And it was taking all dozen or dozen and a half, however many of them, what, it was taking all of them to be able to feed the information monster. Um, and I think because of the, the immediacy of the information that was going out and people seeing it on television, and particularly that we had children involved, that it tugged on the heartstrings of people everywhere, and we started getting donations and packages and stuff, and it was overwhelming. What do you do with it? When you have a semi-load of things show up, what do you do with them? Where do you put them? How do you... How do you sort them? How do you warehouse them? How do you how do you find a way to get that to people that perhaps might need it? Uh, and then how do you tell people, you know, stuff is needed in the immediate time frame, you know, because people have nothing at that point. The people in the Plaza Towers edition, homes were destroyed, everything I had is gone. Uh, yeah, they probably need some clothes. They probably need, you know, things. Now, they don't need a lot of things because they don't have anywhere to put it. They don't have a house. Some of them probably didn't have cars. Um, somebody told me they saw saw somebody with a car, and everything they owned literally was inside that car. So you, know, you can't put a lot of stuff inside of a car. So you know you need some amount of material goods, but not necessarily a lot. And certainly after three, four days, maybe a week, week and a half, when people start getting, okay, you know, where am I going to live? I'm going to go ahead and go and live with my sister, or I'm going to, you know, I found a place to go rent. Uh, I'm going to move. And they start getting insurance checks, and they start getting checks from FEMA, and they start getting checks from the Red Cross, and they have the ability to buy things. Well, at that point, all of the stuff coming in, that's still coming in. We're still getting stuff today. What are we going to do with it? Because people don't want old used clothes at that point. They're going to go to JCPenney's or, or Kohl's or any number of other places and go buy stuff that, you know, is, is of their style and their size and their liking and their, you know, what, what fits them. And that's actually a good thing because that that also gives them the opportunity to do something normal. Mm -hmm. You know, I get to go shopping. Um, you know, I don't have to think about my house that I don't have anymore. So, 
donations management is going to, it, it, it's a huge animal and it's getting worse. And I don't know how, how you tell people don't send stuff. We don't need stuff. If you want to donate, donate some money. Uh, because that's what, what people really need. You know, they, they need, they, they don't want your old underwear. They want to go buy new underwear. Um, and I think it's going to take some sort of culture change, and I don't know how to. You know, it, it's going to take, take somebody far, um, with a far greater presence than I have, to be able to affect that change. Well, is that something that you're responsible for helping figure out at least? At least in general terms, yes. Yeah. Um, donations management, volunteer management. Um, we had hundreds of, uh, even our public safety personnel, who were told over and over and over in every class they go to, don't self-deploy, don't self-respond don't go unless you're called. These people have big hearts. That's why they do what they do. It's sure not for the pay. And when more got hot, got, when more gets hit, we need to go. I've got to go. It, 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 it's what I have to do. And we had hundreds of responders show up that we didn't call for and caused a lot of problems in terms of managing them and, and accounting for them and you know how do you have proper supervision of what they're doing if they're not reporting to anybody um, how do you account for their safety there's just so many some and, and clogged our staging areas and a lot of them didn't clog the staging area because they didn't bother to stop at staging they just went and found something to do and it may have been the right thing or not the right thing to do. So, very, very difficult. Um, but that one's going to be addressed, I'm sure, in the, the academies and the, the statewide training and so on. I know I, uh, I finally snuck out of the office about 3 a.m. Um, and, and went to the command center. You know, I, I had to go deliver something. Paper clips, probably. You know, it was it was an excuse to leave here, an excuse to go see what what really happened. Mm -hmm. um, so I get down there, do what I was going to do, and I'm on my way back. Well, first of all, on my way down, I traveled straight down Broadway to 19th Street, over 19th Street to the fire station. I you know, I do that all the time, and I also travel up and down Broadway at least twice a day because I live. Broadway to 19th and then the other direction. And I had to pass through the tornado path. I'm on the north side here. I had to get to the south side, so I had to drive through it. And as I did so, it struck me that when I had driven from home to work that morning, that all of these houses were there as they always were. And as I'm driving south, those houses are no longer there. And wait a minute, I know the people that live in that house. I wonder if they're okay. Uh, gosh, my wife knows those people. I wonder if they're okay. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but as a responder, you get used to that. And I'm not a responder. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a desk jockey. But I do enough response work, and I've worked in 911 enough to, that, that, you know, you... you you have those thoughts and you, you suppress them. So I go to the command center, I'm on my way back. And of course at every intersection, there are police officers. Now mind you, there's, there's no light, there's no traffic lights, there's, you know, it's just you and whatever you're finding. And most of these police officers were not from here. They were from everywhere. But I, I made, of course, I had to stop at each one of them because they wanted to, where are you? Where are you going? As I should. And, you know, I'm City of Moore. Yes, I'm supposed to be here. 
And so where are you from? Oh, I'm from where? I'm glad you came. You know, thank you for coming. You know, maybe visit with him for a minute. Well, I, I get right up here to the area, uh, again, where the where the actual plant had been, and I stopped, and there's a policeman there from, I forget where he was from, but it was far northeastern Oklahoma. And I'm visiting with him, doing the same, you know, hey, where are you from? Thanks for coming. I'm glad you came. And uh, he tells me, he doesn't, first of all, he doesn't have radio contact with anybody. And so he wanted me to make sure that command knew that come 5 a.m. that he was going to have to leave because he had to go back home. Because he had to go home so he could work his normal shift. Okay. How long have you been here? Well, I worked my shift and as soon as I got off shift, I drove here. So he had worked his eight-hour shift, driven the two or three or four hours it took to get here, worked all night, had to drive three or four hours on home, and then work another eight-hour shift. And, again, it's what they have to do. You know, they, they have big hearts. They, they're, they're pulled. It's, it's like a magnet pulling on them. They have to come. Wait a minute. Stop and think about your safety. Would you want to be a police? You know, being a police officer is a very dangerous job. And even in a small town, it's a very dangerous job. And you have to be alert and aware of your surroundings. And if he had been up at that point when he got back home, if he'd been up 24 hours, worked all night, high stress situation, and then how, how aware of his surroundings was he going to be at home? You know, probably somebody should have kind of got him by the car and said, you're not going anywhere, you're going to go to bed. We're not going to let you leave because, you know, what happens if you fall asleep on the way home? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult juggling act, balancing act between allowing someone to come because they're, they're drawn and they have to. It's, it's, it's what they do. And... being safe and so on about it. So, anyway, yeah, we, we've learned some lessons. Volunteer management is going to be a big issue. Donations management, uh, we learned about the social media. Uh, in terms of response, yeah, we've done that before. Um, you know, we've, we've dug through rubble before. We've, unfortunately, we found bodies before. Uh, treated injuries before. We do that every day. Maybe not the types of injuries we saw there, but, but you know, that's what they do. Um, and the cleanup, wow, we've learned from past ones how to do that between tornadoes and ice storms. We know how to do that. And we did we, we did it different this time. We, we had some technology now that we didn't have available at that point. And... FEMA has actually sent a crew here from Washington to document how we did it because we apparently are setting the standard for how to do it. That's kind of neat. What was the technology? Um, there's a lot more GIS uh, capability now, and they were, I think they, don't hold me to all of this, but I think they put barcodes on all the trucks that came, and every time that they'd have a load, they had a little little something they would read that barcode with and they knew exactly where each load came from, what it had in it, where it went. Uh, the, the management of that was was far better than, than what it has been. And, and we've done it well in the past. It's just that this made it, uh, it, was, it was a different way and it was it was very neat to watch. Uh, bring it back to the mezzanine too, I understand it was the gold standard too for the way it it's been said that other states the, have come in to see how it's done. The mezzanette was the first of its kind, mm -hmm. um, very well managed, very well thought out. The concept was very well thought out. Um, Oklahoma's coming through. Uh, you Probably. cannot say enough about Dr. Crawford and his vision and how he was able to, to take that vision and find a way to accomplish it and then to actually put it into practice. Um, can't say enough about Dale Morris, uh, 
who did a lot of the, the engineering and the, the computer side of, of how it works. Uh, Andrew is still with us um, you know, on the outreach side. Uh, we've had some, some folks you know, come in and, and you know, fill the shoes for a while, and, and a lot of them have moved on and, and have done the same thing elsewhere. In your years in the emergency management system, what's been the biggest change? Uh, our profession has completely changed. I mean, I know uh, social media. And well, technology computer. in general mm -hmm. has has completely changed how we do business, and how we do business completely changed on September 11th. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the prior to that, yeah, we had plans. Yeah, okay, you're that you're that guy that. Mr. Doom and Bloom. You know, Bloom is my name, so that's, that's my nickname. And oh, my other one's Radar, by the way. But, um, you know, I'm that guy that's always saying, well, you know, what if we had a plane crash? What if we had a tornado? What if we had... Well, people don't want to think about that. You know, they want to think about, you know, going to the lake and going to their grandkids' baseball games. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever's important in their life. Um, and so we made plans, and, and I can remember plans. I probably have one down in my bottom of my bookcase somewhere, an old plan, that I can assure you that it referenced people and agencies and departments that had no idea that they were being referenced or knew they had a part in disaster. Um, for instance, I know that, that it, the plan referenced somebody at the, you know, some director at the health department. I didn't know what the health department did and didn't know what their role would be in an emergency or disaster and never met the people that were, were referenced in the plan. It's just you always put that person down and fill the blank. September 11th came along. All of a sudden, people understood about emergencies and disasters and and the need for preparation, the need to coordinate, and, and every agency took a look and goes, what part do I have? Mm -hmm. And instead of just saying that, they also found a way to, to, to tie and start coordinating with people, and I can tell you, I guarantee I know who our health department people are now, and I know what their role is, and they're very involved. It would never have happened September 11th. So we, we see a lot. Of course, we now have degree programs in that. Prior to to September 11th, there was there were a few around, but now everybody's got a degree program. Everybody's got a certification program. Everybody's the the expert. Uh, we see hundreds of young people that want to study Homeland Security and and emergency management. That never happened. We were all a bunch of retired fire chiefs. <laughs> so, or in my case, retired out of communications, or you know, retired out of the police department. Some people are. You know, we, now we're seeing young people involved. So, kind of interesting. Definitely has changed. Did you ever expect to be sitting in that chair? Come have a. Oh, you? No. Never. Or in it this long either? Oh, heavens no. Um, so uh, what's, what's next for you? Um, well, I have a ways to go. Uh, again, we're moving into a new facility. Uh, it's very, very exciting. Uh, probably when we move, I will be gaining an assistant. So it'll be, I won't have the the 24-7, 365 days a year responsibility that I have now. I'll be able to share that with someone. It'll be hard to give that up. I can tell you it was very hard to give up the 911 side. I needed to, and I understand that, mm -hmm. um, because there, there was just far more than, than one person could do. Uh, but it was very difficult. You know, when you, when you have this ear tuned on that side of the window for 14 years, it's very, you know, and, and about half of an eye that's that's always watching, you know. You'd hear the door, you know, dispatchers hear everything. You know, they, they don't, 
they don't realize that. But I guarantee you, if someone after hours were to beep that back door and, and use their badge to come in the back door, they hear that beep. Um, if you somebody badges that door into dispatch, I heard it from here. And I don't know who's coming in? You know, is it anything I is it anything I need to go see what's going on? And it was uh, it was very difficult for the first several weeks to to not come in and immediately open the door in and go see what was going on and you know what happened overnight and how's the kids and and uh, you know come in here and sit down and then you hear the door now oh, wait it's not mine anymore you know don't I don't have to worry about that. And I suspect there will be a, who's got a school bus fired going? NPS, that must be Norman. And they must have gone to Lawton. Yep. So you, even while I talk to you, there's there's things that you you keep an eye on and watch. And, and uh, even though I don't have any responsibility over there, I still kind of keep an ear out to what's going on because if they have a disaster of some sort, then I have responsibilities. Multitasking in a, in a different. Oh, absolutely. Different. So, in the next 10 years? The next 10 years, I expect to see technology completely rule. It almost does today. Um, I foresee our means of communicating change. Uh, you're already seeing a lot of that. Uh, when I was a young emergency manager, uh, we always worried in disasters about these phones becoming overloaded and, you know, the phone systems were worthless uh, because everybody would pick up and there wasn't enough dial tone to go around. Well, nowadays you can use those, but the same thing happens with cell phones. And, you know, as we move our, our communications capabilities farther and farther onto a device that each person has, um, you know, there, there's challenges with that. But we, particularly when you get into the older people like me, we have to be cognizant that, of how other people communicate. Um, you know, my parents don't text. I do some, not like my son does. But I have to understand, and that, that and that's why I try and hang around with my son, is to make sure that I know how he and his friends communicate, because when there's a storm, I need to be able to break into that somehow. I, I need to know how to do that. And that's that will be a challenge uh, over the next 10 years, even for today's younger generation, of how to keep up with how we communicate with each other. I think the Mesonet can do, you can get access to it. There's, the, there's an the app, dish. absolutely. And yes, I do have it on here. Have you had, have you, has someone tried to pull you away from more? No. Job opportunities? No. Uh, I, I have a very, I, I'm in a very unique situation. It's a, it's a position that I basically created. It, uh, I was, I've been the only paid emergency management person the city's ever had. Uh, before me was was a series of volunteers. Um, who, none of whom were from public safety. I might add, uh, or at least the ones I know about. Um, being a department head of the city, I'm very well paid in terms of what you earn at a city government. Um, I work at a larger city in the state in a city that has a lot of forward resources at the moment. So um, most of the state agencies couldn't pay me what I'm being paid now, nor could they offer me a brand new facility that I designed um, and brand new equipment to go in that, you know, well, I'd be foolish to leave. And uh, most people recognize that and don't even bother. 
So I'm, I'm very happy here. Do you have a take on, and you can say no to this, on storm shelters then? What about them? To, what, where, where are you headed with that? With schools and schools. Making them mandatory. Sheltering in general is the big topic that we've got to figure out. Um, in fact, that's what I was working on before you came, uh, was individual sheltering. Uh, the the two, two big bugaboos right now are community shelters or individual shelters or some combination thereof, and what to do with kids at schools. The residential sheltering or the individual versus community, uh, in my city, that's a no-brainer. Uh, I can't build a facility that will house 56,000 people. Uh, and even if I could, how do I get 56,000 people to that facility without traffic jams uh, in the less than the 15 minute lead time that the weather service is able to give me? So, uh, you know, community sheltering makes sense in small communities and particularly very small geographic area communities. Uh, where you can get to a shelter within five minutes, everybody knows where it's at, um, and you don't have traffic jams. Uh, in a metropolitan area, not so much. So uh, at that point, you have to, to promote individual sheltering, um, and we're doing that uh, after the 99 tornado, again after the 03 tornado. Uh, there were state-run programs that promoted uh, storm shelter installation. If you put one in, if you were were one of the people that got selected, then you could go put one in and have about three quarters of your cost reimbursed to you. We are working on developing a similar program to that right now. <clears throat> in fact, it will happen. It's just a matter of when we announce it, how we, you know, we're we're, we're getting all the the ducks lined up right now. In fact, that's what all that mess is. Um, and I think that we actually have about 22,000 homes and more. Uh, right now, about 4,000 or more of those have shelters already in them, which I suspect is a high percentage compared to other places. Um, but again, in the 99 storm, people who were destroyed got first dibs on the money. Well, I had a lion's share of people destroyed, so we were... And we think I figured we put in about 500 safe rooms then. Uh, 03 was the same way. People that were destroyed had first dibs. But we had a lion's share of the people destroyed, so we had another 250, 300 out of that one. Uh, so Sheltering has been very popular anyway. Uh, people have been putting a lot of them in, just, just doing it. Um, since May 20th, yeah, there's... You, you can't hardly find somebody more that hasn't put one in. Um, a lot of the new homes are going back up, having poured in place above ground. A lot of the existing homes have um, uh, shelters that are being put in their garages, you know, underneath their garages. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I think we've still got to figure out how, and there hasn't been a lot addressed on this, we've still got to address rental homes, apartments, and mobile homes. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of mobile homes, but so I, I don't have that worry other people do. We've got to figure that, we've got to crack that one yet. Um, businesses, you don't see anybody that's got them. Very few, very few. Schools, I, I'm torn. Um, I've always thought that schools should be required to have them, uh, should always have been required to have them. Um, again, I come from Kansas. We have basements there. Um, you know, where I went to grade school, I can, the, the mental picture I have of my grade school is that if you walked in the east door, you walked in and I don't remember whether you went through the second set of doors or whether it was between those, right there was the stairs to the basement. 
and when you got to the bottom, they had a classroom there. The band room was was on down, and if you went made a U-turn, you were in the bomb shelter, and that's where, and it was a large area, it was just a storage area. Um, most of it didn't have. In fact, it didn't have anything. There weren't walls. It wasn't used for classes. It was, you know, they stored extra tables and chairs down there, some, but not. There, there was a huge open area. When there was a tornado drill, that's where everybody in the school went. We had a large school. Um, come to Oklahoma, <laughs> we don't have basements here. So... My school district has 32 campuses that are both in the city limits, more city limits of Oklahoma City, split about evenly. Um, out of those, one school has a shelter, an, an engineered shelter. And it's only because it was blown away on May 3rd, and when they rebuilt the school, they put an engineered shelter. Unfortunately, the two or three schools they built since then don't have shelters in them. I don't know why. Well, I'm sure it's economics, finance. Um, I guarantee you that when they rebuild Plaza Towers, when they rebuild Briarwood, I know those schools are going to have shelters in them. Uh, the interesting part will be they were in the process of building two other grade schools, just getting ready to break ground on them. Will those schools have shelters? don't know. We'll see. I would think it would be political suicide on my school board's part to not put them in. But what do I know? I'm not a politician. The, um, but the next question is, okay, so we, we spend an extra, my schools have five, 600 kids in them. They're not small schools. My high school, I have two high schools in my city limits. They both have 2,000, 2,500 kids in them, plus staff. Again, you're talking very large facility. And how much does it cost to build something to shelter those kids? A million dollars? Two million dollars. I don't, you know, the high schools, gosh, I can't imagine building them. And how often do they have to be used? So does the, where does that benefit cost analysis work out? And does it maybe make more sense on days that you have weather forecast that you simply dismiss school, let the kids go home because we're putting shelters in the homes? I don't know. I, I, I don't know where that balance is. On the ones that are put in the homes, are they registered? Do you know who has them and who doesn't? Mm -hmm. For the most part. So you know. uh, it's not mandatory that somebody registers with us. Uh, well, actually, yes, they're supposed to because when they put it in, it's just like anything else that you build. You're supposed to get a building permit. And that's what we use for our registration process. Um, but people pretty much, I, I think most of them that are here are registered. Do you have one? I do not. Does this building have one? This building does not. Well, the new one? The new building has 8,500 square feet. It has 10 inches. That's why I don't have windows. The whole building is okay. No, the whole building's not. The whole building's 50,000 square feet. So there's only a portion of it. But that portion is the operations center for 911. It's the emergency operations center. And we have a room there for our uh, computer folks. We'll be, we'll be able to move the people that work within the building will all have a place to go and the people that have to be able to continue working regardless of what the storm is doing can't mm -hmm. that's one change then yeah. that was already in process of course you know after May 3rd May 8th and always May all except for the one that was in the one following, but usually in May. In May. You can't go on vacation in May then. I don't. I don't travel from many. I, 
I generally, my wife and I are basketball fans. We generally go to the women's basketball tournament for the Big 12, which is second, third week in March, generally second week in March. And when we get back from that trip, I don't travel from then until about the first of June. Or if I do, I don't go very far. Uh, I can tell you that this year, uh, my wife and I had planned a weekend in Dallas on May 18th and 19th. Uh, we were actually going down on Friday night. Uh, Saturday was going to be shopping in Allen and you know some other places that we like to go when we're down there. We had tickets to the Rangers, uh, so we we're going to watch a baseball game. Sunday afternoon, we were going had tickets to the Dallas Symphony, <laughs> and of course, it had been very slow weather season. Nothing had happened. Nothing happened. Darn if about Tuesday or so before we went, and maybe storms this weekend. Closer it got by Wednesday afternoon or Thursday, I had called the symphony, changed our symphony tickets to the Friday evening performance. So we went down early Friday, went to the symphony Friday night, did some shopping, we were watching the weather. We were watching the weather. Uh, what do we do? We actually got to, there's a Sonic just north of the stadium where the Rangers play. We stopped, I was going to get something to drink before we went in. I took one more look at the weather, and we drove home. Um, that was on the 18th. Uh, the storm stayed west and didn't do too much that night. But I didn't want to be three hours away. Uh, Sunday we get up, storms fire, spotters are out, nothing happened here. Uh, Edmund, Carney, Beth Lakers. Well, Little Axe, Beth Lakers. Um, I actually took um, the, the EM at Shawnee and I, are, we're, we're both old guys. We went. Of you together, we've known each other forever, and uh, I took Don over some light trailers, construction tires, you know, portable lights, at midnight on the nineteenth. And uh, you know, got home, got up next morning, storms again. Ah, oh, eh, just west of us. Ah, eh, got hit. <laughs> Had to call Don on the radio going. Look, I know you're busy because you're still fighting it, but can you can you bring my light trailer or something? You know, I, I can't come after them. I'm, I'm stuck. And he already had, of course, being an old hand and experienced, he already had it. Cruz had, had uh, loaded them up and were on, on their way with him. So, yeah, I, I don't travel, and when I do, I, I still watch. Watch the method. I do. Um... You know, the, it has played a pretty good role in your career I, in life, then, has it? I realized that uh, this is now a private company, but the Radar Scope app, which came out of folks that came from OK First, doesn't it? Uh, right there's the app. It's live right now. And I assure you that wherever I go, that's right there. And that, that's my go to. And if I'm not watching that, there's the Mesonet app. So, yeah, it's a great tool. Absolutely. I, I, I look back on the days of, of when we didn't have weather data other than maybe a teletype if we were lucky, and we were dialing back and forth on the TV, hoping to see a, a radar. And I look now at, I carry it with me. And it's getting smaller. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can do the same thing here. Um, we had a storm potential, the storm one. By the way, the May 3rd storm and the May 20th storm were both on Mondays. 
when they had city council meetings planned. Hmm. Which is, uh, you know, they, they went ahead and had an emergency meeting on May 3rd because they knew there were some things they needed to do very quickly. They had some financing things they were doing that unrelated to the storm. They had to do, they did them, done. May 20th, they just canceled the meeting. They had no choice. Um, but I can remember a different storm that ended up not doing anything. And, of course, I'm required to go to city council meetings, city department head, and I, yeah. And I literally sat in council chambers watching the radar. And every once in a while somebody would look at me, query, you know, just the look of, hey, is there anything going on? Now nah, we got it. And, it, you know, it, the thought that I had, and, and I've been other places too, that, um, you know, if I didn't have something like this, if I didn't have OK First, if I didn't have the Radar Scope app, if I didn't have, then I wouldn't have gotten to go out and and sit at a, my son's basketball game or somewhere I'd have had to had to have been right here. So that that allows me to to do my business or watch my business, but not be here. So it's it's good stuff. It sounds like you were in the right place at the right time with all of this, and Moore's been lucky to have you. I don't know about that. But. Or vice versa then, okay. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story with us today. I would never have thought, I would never have dreamed that when I was, when I took over as the Civil Defense Director and was poking the Assistant Fire Chiefs going, hey, Terry, what would you do if we had a tornado that you know, sat down on, you know, west of Fire Station 2 and moved across and did blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they, they'd look at me. And of course, I was the kid at that point, and they were the old hands. And they'd look at me and go, go away, that ain't never going to happen. Well, of course, when when I went away or, you know, when, the, when they were off, then they go, hmm, I wonder what I would do. So, you know, it, it, it triggered their thought process. But I would never have thought when I was sitting there poking them, going, hey, what if we had that we'd have actually had not one, not two, but three major storms. So it was good that you were poking. Yes, it was. That's what the job is. Well, thank you. Thanks again. You're welcome.